Ron Frazier, the founder of Hope and Beyond. Ron, I heard you were born and raised in the San Francisco Haight-Ashbury. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I was born in San Francisco. Oh, okay. Right. But I did live in the Haight-Ashbury uh, from uh, 74. I moved into Haight-Ashbury at 211 Downey Street. That's up the hill here. And in those days, this was a quiet little village. Haight-Ashbury was a beautiful place. A little mama Italian restaurant. She ran it. She was a widow. We used to go in there for a dollar twenty-five a five-course meal. I mean, those were the days. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I can say that, as far as I'm concerned, Haight Ashbury really is at the heart of the city. Mm -hmm. uh, the evolution into the '60s. <clears throat> the evolution into the '60s. Uh, that was an easy transition, because I used to hang out in North Beach. Mm -hmm. In North Beach. Everything happened. Jazz, parties, uh, you know, gallons of wine and other things made a party night of it in North Beach. <laughs> a lot of those folks kind of moved over to the Haight-Ashbury and it was a quiet scene. I think they were called beatniks at that time. Mm -hmm. Then things kind of evolved and they became kind of hippified, you know, hippies came into the mm -hmm. Then the flower in your hair, the whole evolution was there. It was fantastic. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I mean, you couldn't walk down the street without touching someone, and there was no way on Hate Street you could drive a car. That's how fantastic it was. You know, but I have to say that the party mood led into other things. People from different areas, different kinds of pleasures that led into dark sides came into play. But Hate ashbury is still here today. And what it has and what it contributes, you're not going to find anywhere else in the globe. It sustains itself. Exactly. So tell us more about uh, Hope and Beyond. Well, Hope and Beyond is an evolution from <clears throat> Summer of Love International, uh, like Billy McCarthy, a lot of other people, all volunteered. We did a series of uh, uh, Summer of Love events actually for the food bank. Mm -hmm. And we raised over a period of, I think it was a year and a half, over 200,000 pounds of food for the food bank. And I think on the 20th anniversary of the Summer of Love, the figure was, I think it was 20, 20 tons of food, right. which is a lot of food for the food bank. Now, the, the point being that it's the kind of thing that started in the 60s, the evolution of the Summer of Love concerts, uh, they were carried out by a whole group of volunteers who were natives and people who came across country, came from all over the world to be a part of these events. They're still going on, but not, not in the same way every year. They're usually anniversary events. Right. But <clears throat> going back to that, when I was here in, in the Summer of Love period, uh, earlier on, actually, in uh, Haight-Ashbury, uh, I was involved in theaters. We, we had a few theaters in San Francisco, and our people that worked in shows like The Fantastics, which had a six-year run in San Francisco, uh, I think it closed close to 40 years in New York, uh, the crew would come on over here and they would go to the straight theater on Haight Street <clears throat> on Saturdays to perform for the kids who didn't have an opportunity to see theater. Like many, many groups had. Uh, you know, the 60s, that was really a wonderful time. Uh, even Bill Graham, you know, the Bill Graham organization they bought. Bill used to call our organization for promotional hints and leads in for advertising uh, because he was doing theater in the park. And was it at the Mime Troop at that time? Right. right. They're still going to my trip, but I don't remember. Yeah, they are. <laughs> it was Ronnie, someone that was running it at that time. Uh, there is so much about San Francisco that, that leads in and, and folds out from the hate. Uh, you know, North Beach was a character that kind of helped the hate evolve in, in, in the hippie era. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that character, uh, people like Eric Nord, uh, people that started North Beach festivals there, uh, people that I worked with, like Arthur Meyer, who was the director for a lot of the shows here, uh, all that evolution of creativity that came out of North Beach, molded into the Haight-Ashbury, is in part what helped people who came here to feel good. The young artists out in the Bay Area, the, the Jerry Garcias, uh, uh, the Gray Slicks, all the people who, who kind of meld into the time made what that was. <clears throat> and people say, well, you're thinking in the past, or it's old. This, it isn't. 
It's all heart space. That's all it's about. It's simple human heart space and that evolution works. I'd love to hear more about the straight theater. Uh, I was told there were breakfasts, there were uh, events and things. What was the straight theater as far well, as the community have. wanted? <clears throat> well, the, the, the straight theater, I mean, I actually went there and you know, see whatever kind of movies. I don't know if they were first run or not. Don't really. They remember. showed movies. Okay. <laughs> showed movies, right? And that's why uh, they didn't show early early matinees on the weekends. And that's how the uh, the theater thing started, where people would come in from various theaters in the city and and put on the sh the programs for basically youth in, in the Bay Area that, that weren't accustomed to theater. And Subsequently, there were all sorts of community events that were allowed to take place there. And I believe that was owned by the United Artists Theater Circuit, which was Marshall Navy, who had Winterland and all the other places that are involved. Uh, in our organization, we were in partnership personally with Marshall Navy on a lot of theater productions. So there was an interaction <clears throat> from all strata of life in San Francisco. There was a time when that interaction melded together and made and showed what the city that can do was. And that was the heart. Were you ever there? Did you ever see light shows? Was there ever music happening there? Because I heard they used to uh, uh, have music as well. They eventually evolved into to certain music after the film closed down. Then it went through a period that, that it had some light shows and some music events there. I don't think I followed that that much at that time. I was involved in the theater in a bit into the film industry and. We worked with people at that time who were well known today, like Sherry Lansing and people like that. And uh, you just get busy. And I evolved away from from the Haight Ashbury when when the when the dark scene kind of mellowed in. And you, you know, now that I come back, it's 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 in a sense now as if you're walking in the same shoes you did in the '60s. It's the flavors different. People are a little different with a little few different opinions about things, but the space still there. When you say the dark side, when did that come about? Oh, well, you know, my memories are, are uh, as far as the dates, I, I don't know. But I think, I think the whole evolution from, from the highest point to, to the dark side took about 18 months to a couple of years, you know, and then it started. Because the dark side was when outside sources, mm -hmm. merchants of dark drugs mm -hmm. came in to sell. Right. And that's what happened. And because the people <clears throat> had an innocence of communication, a kind of interaction uh, that actually spirits me today to the projects I'm involved in. That's why I, I brought in a poster uh, from the Soviet American Peace Walk. Uh, and that poster represents the kind of spirit that we're talking about. And that spirit was an openness. And that represented over 200 citizens from the Soviet Union who walked and bust across the United States, <clears throat> who lived with, ate with, talked with, fought with in a fun way, had a good time with Amer American citizens, saw shopping centers, sure. saw that people could evolve and discuss the matter, and went with it in such a way, well, here it is, somebody put it right in my hand. <laughs> There's a commercial, folks. Get with this spirit, get with this understanding. This is, this is the kind of thing that took place. <clears throat> this was the summer of love in global essence. Mm -hmm. This is what made the Soviet people understand the kind of heart space that Americans had. There was no other scene like this anywhere else. Can you imagine taking the evil empire to the quote evil empire and inter like, <laughs> the inner relationship of their people coming together inspiring their governments. Now this couldn't have happened, I've got to be frank, this couldn't have happened if you didn't have an American hierarchical government agreeing with, with the Soviet government that, okay, let's find a way to do something. <clears throat> so it was at a time when the leadership at least was conscious enough to let the people get together. And that getting together evolved into, one year after this, the fall of the Soviet Union. And it wasn't the fall of the people. It was the change of consciousness, the change of government, and the evolution. Hey, we're all still working today. There's no perfect government. There's no perfect human being except those who are simply evolved to care. And that's what it's about. Anyway, that was a good time, too. That's right. What part, where did that take place in, in San Francisco? 
Well, that took place in, in a place that I just love, and now they're remodeling it, but it'll take a bit. Is That's the Banshell Music Concourse area of Golden Gate Park. Now, we've had other events that went to the polo field, which is a grander area, but not near as charming. Right. The Banshell. <clears throat> now, the coincidence of this, there was a young girl named Sita, Sita Spreckles, that had traveled with some of the Soviet performers that we had here, and coincidentally, when I asked her to come on stage, she said, oh, my grandmother built this. So that kind of shows you that evolution on an international level of what has taken place in San Francisco. Uh, you know, my prejudicial attitude for the city goes way back. I was born in the city. Uh, my uncle was, was the captain of the port of the city, so I got to see a lot of things and saw people, and I liked the international flavor of the city. <clears throat> it still exists. A uh, lot of changes, physical changes. Uh, the city, I think, is a little bit overpriced for humanity's sake, but... <laughs> so do we all. <laughs> that's something that can be worked. That'll evolve. Things will, things will come to a point where they can relax a little bit. I think the, the current administration and government uh, seems to be doing the best job that you can do trying to make things work. There's never going to be an agreement with government. But unless we get to the point of interacting with people, communicating with people, you're not going to have the kind of harmony that took place in 1967 in San Francisco. Exactly. <clears throat> I have a question. Um, uh, it seemed like every generation had its uh, uh, search for love and hope and all of this, and then things happened and the light, the dark came into the hate. There was always that that changed things. There was a result. And I know you're, part, you're, you're founder of the organization Hope and Beyond, um, I'd like to know a little bit about that because that I believe that supporting uh, aware, a, a public awareness for young people on the issues of AIDS and the problems of AIDS. Uh, Hope and Beyond actually started with a, with a uh, initiated a program with Artists for Humanity is another organization I've been involved in, in, in programming. Uh, and we did an event uh, a year after we did an event in City Hall or the children as teachers of peace. <clears throat> and that kind of evolved me because they were children from 33 countries, and that was a great interaction. And so that was in 85. So 86, we produced the, the Artists for Humanity Children's International Awards, and that was under the banner of Hope and Beyond. Now, obviously, the concept is hope. There's always an opportunity. There's always a way to go with hope. Beyond means you're going to get where you're focusing. You're, you, you know you can do it. You've got the hope, you've got the energy, and that spirit carries you beyond to some success. <clears throat> well, Hope and Beyond in later years, through the 90s, we worked on Global Garden Project. And Global Garden Projects was part of the Hope and Beyond team. But we were focusing on the bioaccumulation, that means the body burden, of toxic chemicals that most all of us, if not all of us, have. <clears throat> and in that time period, Focusing on that, I, so I got a report from World Health just by calling Geneva and talking to people, and they were telling me, well, the highest rates of breast cancer are in Marin County, on the globe, and a place in San Francisco called Hunter's Point Shipyard. Now, <clears throat> those high rates of breast cancer, when I went out to talk to the community, uh, General Hospital, uh, Marin Hospital, no one seemed to know that such a figure and such a statistic existed. So I went through maybe a 10-year battle, more or less, of fighting that, and looking at military bases, and because they were going through closure and supposed cleanup, which meant, frankly, a little bit of uh, cover-up, literally. <clears throat> Take a toxic site, they say it's a dump site, that couldn't get licensed today as a toxic waste site, and cover it, and then say it's contained and controlled. I'm not even talking about the groundwater and the leachate and everything out, coming out of it and traveling out to the San Francisco Bay. There are a lot of issues I don't want to get on that now because if I do, that's a whole campaign I would be driven to and could never stop. But Hope and Beyond today, <clears throat> in that looking at toxic chemicals, we realize that the transgenerational effect from mother to child of those chemicals are a direct causation to a next generation. And in talking with people and seeing the, the pandemic of AIDS, we realize that the same kind of transitional effect took, was in place. Except that AIDS, unfortunately, <clears throat> is a character like chemicals 
may stay in the body for 20 years before you're, there's a causation of cancer from a chemical. AIDS can go unknown in its HIV stage for up to 10 years plus without symptoms which would carry a person to go in and get tested. So when you imagine <clears throat> that you have young people coming out that become sexually active at younger and younger ages who may not even have a symptom before they're 25 years old, who may have been in some contact with any number of other young people, who in turn may have been in some contact with any number of young people, you can see the potential. <clears throat> the potential in India, which is a place that we focus on, for students, so that students can interact in English. And Hope and Beyond uh, is a 501c3 nonprofit educational organization. And what it primarily does is evolve young people in experiential service, involve them in activities that bring them learning through service. So that's called service learning. So that's basically the program. But we're talking about AIDS. We're talking about India. <clears throat> Excuse me, India becoming the number one nation with AIDS. There's a lot going on there. They have no idea there, as we have no idea here, how many people really are infected with HIV AIDS. There's no way to tell until a person's tested. They have new tests now that they take oral fluid, 20 minutes they'll see a result if they show up as having an antibody of the HIV. Now, <clears throat> that is only half the challenge. The other half, of course, is, is the treatment available for that person to catch a hold of that, take the medication, and from that, evolve with some sort of quality of life, rather than going, frankly, down the toilet of disease. Amazing. Um, I'm really curious that it have the city of San Francisco, um, areas like North Beach and Haight-Ashbury, especially where children come, young people come from all over the world, um, do you get support? Do you find the community of raising the public awareness to young people on prevention? Do you get support? Is it a fight here? Um, uh, <clears throat> you know, this is San Francisco. Now, for the world, they think, in a sense, San Francisco was one of the origins of, of the disease. Of course, it isn't and hadn't been. Uh, those origins are African and they have to do with possible human interaction that may or may not have been uh, purely by nature or by man's folly. You know, those are questions that are still left open. <clears throat> San Francisco has excellent programs. Uh, uh, Dr. Murr Silverman was here, who was the head of the health department at one time, who became the head of AMFAR, the AIDS organization. Uh, they helped to initiate many programs. San Francisco has beautiful programs. The problem is not, <clears throat> are there programs? The problem is apathy. The problem is a young person or an adult not believing because of their strength and their character and their social involvement that they can contract a disease. Apathy is the danger. It, it is basically the walking skeleton. And that's where the problem is. Now, that's why service learning is so important <clears throat> because amongst young people, they get involved, they learn, and they can bring that program back. But that is a small margin because you're reaching the proactive young person. What is needed are artists, people who get out there, who are role models, people who are known, people who are appreciated, and that's the main line is the entertainment industry. And <clears throat> if those people can get back on it, stay on it, and drum into what they will talk about, be responsible, Leave a legacy. That legacy is for young people to lose the apathy, become conscious, and interact in consciousness. Because this is not just a disease. This is a pandemic, a, a global epidemic that has a hidden factor that will eat your life away in 10 years if you're not tested or receive treatment. And touching on that, um, I heard that you were putting on a show or co-producing a show in India about AIDS awareness in October? Is that so? <clears throat> yes, and what that is about is we are interacting with health organizations, right. with the health ministry, and with certain political and social ends mm -hmm. to bring about a result of testing consciousness for interacting Indian and American students. 
and bringing it to the public forum so that there is a greater consciousness because of the events, the interaction, whereas the child becomes the teacher. Almost biblical in a sense, but it's there. It will accomplish a great deal with the support of artists. The only way you can get media is to get personality in front of them. You can't <clears throat> drive the press on old stories. And AIDS is an old story that continues, is hidden, and will have devastating results without action. Well, I'm curious, in India, what is the education level at this point? The government is doing everything it can. It's been given a lot of money. There are beautiful organizations there. They are reaching people. But there is stigma in India. <clears throat> uh, a, a wife who feels that she had, may have contracted it from a traveling husband as a metaphor to, towards it. Going to a clinic alone can cause a stigma and a disruption in the family. Going to, to, to receive treatment in a public forum can cause a stigma and a reaction within a family. That's why the beauty of the new tests. The beauty of the new tests are you can take it, you don't need a lab, you'll get a result, it's portable, you can be anywhere, you can be in a home, you can be in a forest, you don't have to be in a medical clinic, you don't have to walk through the for front door, you can find out, you can have an answer, and you can appreciate your lives and the lives of others. And it's out in the market right now. It is not sold publicly, it's out in the market, <clears throat> and our people, uh, students, have raised funds to buy some, and I'm hammering and pulling corporations, hammering and pulling the manufacturer to supply it so that we can reach a goal of one million plus test units that we can help interact with our brothers and sisters in, in India. I, I heard you were going to go into at that event, debut, give them out to the crowd. And... Uh, <clears throat> the event will, will, will be superseded by smaller health events. Good stuff. Good. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think question. music, uh, yeah. you, you were saying something about music making it more, less of a stigma, by the education of the young people somehow. <clears throat> no, okay. One, two, three, four. We will have the tests put out to healthcare facilities. Healthcare workers will have this test in advance of the October 2nd event, which incidentally is a great day. It's Mahatma Gandhi's birthday, and it will be a national holiday, and we expect to <clears throat> run up our flag on that national holiday. And the Indian government is very concerned about this. They're very aware. They know that there are national health reports and international reports that say that India will have the number one cases of AIDS within this decade. Now, they know they have 5 million plus <clears throat> known cases. That means someone who's walked in the door to be reported or tested. That doesn't mean anything when you've got 1 billion people and you've got, you've got how many young people in the 1 billion? You've got 600 million people who could be susceptible to it because they're sexually active plus. So when we go in there from Hope and Beyond and we talk about Hope and Beyond and 1 million plus, that's because that's our goal and drive to bring one million units in. But it is an interaction, it is a working together, it's a people-to-people -people process <clears throat> and for students peer-to-peer. -peer, that's the program. Raise awareness, involve people, and ask, plead, and the conscious will come forward who will help bring the media and help keep the media focused on the events. It's the only way is to focus on the next level. A young person looks to the next level. A 10-year-old looks to the 16-year-old, and a 16-year-old looks to the 25, that person who's out there. We all want evolution. We all look towards what might be for us. I have a question. If this tape is viewed 100 years from now, your life and your, you, what's motivated you in your life and the hard work that you've done, somebody will look at this tape 100 years from now. How, what would... How would, how would you feel at peace? What would you hope someone would get from this? Knowing, knowing the youth that came to the Haight-Ashbury looking for love, uh, looking, uh, which then creates free love, it creates uh, freedoms, and yet you have the attacks of the dark forces and whatever. Somebody looking at this 100 years from now, who you are, Ron Frazier, tell me what you would feel at peace at if somebody... What would you feel at peace at that they would get that you have been doing your life with, that you have been doing?
especially with Hope and Dion. Well, from my personal view, my personal view from you're saying myself personally, hey, just get the spirit. 